Okay, so I normally ask people to tell me who they are so I don't mispronounce their names. So who are you? <laughs> Ted Osbach. Okay. And uh, for those people who don't know, what, what is a Bezier? Uh, Bessie Games publishes uh, all sorts of uh, board games for pretty much the whole family. Um, the ones that we're probably most known for are the strategy games like Suburbia and Castles of Man, King Ludwig, and also the social deduction games in the Ultimate Werewolf line. Okay. Um, now, I know before this you were involved in uh, computers a lot, uh, especially Adobe Illustrator and whatnot. So what made you take the leap from programming, I guess it is what you did, to board games. And yeah, it's actually product management, so it wasn't... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I noodled around with that in high school, but that's about as far as that got. Um, so yeah, I was in product management at Adobe and a few other companies like Intuit um, for the last uh, 15 years or so. And um, and I've been, of course, always playing board games. So playing board games uh, you know, just becomes more and more of a hobby the more games you have, and then... Uh, I had been always designing games, but never very seriously until the last uh, seven, eight years or so, and uh, doing that more and more and more. And then in the last year and a half, that actually became the full-time thing of what I do, and uh, software has now gone away, and uh, board games have replaced it, which is kind of nice. Yeah, especially for us, uh, the consumers. <laughs> um, like I, I do enjoy, I have four-year games uh, right now. I do enjoy them quite a bit. My wife does too, uh, Suburbia, which surprised me. Um, I didn't think she'd get into that a little heavier Euro type game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she, that's one of her favorite games, Suburbia. Um, so uh, how, how did you get in, started in the hobby and in, in the gaming end of it, not designing? Uh, just for gaming in general, I mean, I've always been gaming. Um, I think uh, the actual um, jumping into more um, Euro type games. Uh, didn't take place until, you know, for about 15 years ago or so. And uh, as with most people, Settlers was the thing that kind of pushed me over the edge from uh, realizing that there's, you know, a lot more than uh, the various uh, party games and uh, generic stuff that I had just seen in, in you know, regular stores. So, um, you know, Settlers, uh, Puerto Rico, games like that, um, you know, just... You know, as most people who get into the hobby and they find these games for the first time, you get kind of overwhelmed. And uh, right then, Board Game Geek had just been started had just started up, but it had been it was enough that I went and you know, got as many of the top 100 games as I possibly could. Um, you know, one of those things where you're just totally totally engrossed with with the hobby, and uh, you know, uh, nothing else was more interesting than that at that time. Yeah, you only see half of my collection here, but yeah, I understand. <laughs> so, what was the first game you designed? Uh, the first, well, the first game that was published, there's a big difference. First game designed, I mean, that goes back to when I was a little kid. Um, we, uh, a, a friend of mine, um, we were probably in fourth or fifth grade, and we had been playing Tactics 2, and I'm sure it was very wrong. That's an Avalon Hill game, uh, a little war game. Uh, well, actually, a big war game now that I think about it. Uh, we had with lots of chits. And uh, we decided that we were going to make a 3D version of that. And so we actually basically carved ourselves out and built out of wood and plaster and all sorts of stuff this really cool terrain version of a Tactics 2 board that we custom designed and we wrote up our own rules for it. And uh, that, that was more fun than playing the game Tactics 2, which, again, I have not played it since I was little, so I don't remember if we played it right or not. But I do remember the experience of spending months and months and months with my friend designing this big board, this big 3D board that we painted uh, down in his basement and uh, coming up with our own rules. And I don't know if we ended up ever actually even playing the game. I just know that the designing process was a ton of fun. It was really fun uh, coming up with that. And then ever since then, um, whether it's been uh, D&D campaigns or card games or party games or anything else, uh, that's always been a lot of fun to you know be on that side of the fence, the designing side. Uh, still enjoying playing games, of course, but uh, there's definitely something that got, got bit by the designer bug when I was uh, pretty young. That's cool. Um, now, uh, is your wife your main gaming partner? Uh, usually, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, we play a lot of stuff uh, two-player. Um, 
both multiplayer games as well as uh, two-player games. And then, you know, we have a ton of different um, friends and, and groups. And, of course, now a lot of our gaming is playtesting, of course, uh, for new games. So I would say that probably it's 80% of the time we're playtesting and only about 20% of the time we're actually playing other games. Um, and those I look forward to quite a bit. We have a um, this, this really neat little uh, event that we've been putting on every year for the last uh, four years called post Essen Weekend. And right after Essen, uh, we, get, we get together with about 30, 40 friends, and we play as many of the Essen releases as we can over the weekend right after Essen to try and get everyone you know, on board to figure out what's new and what's good. And, and, that, and that, that's one of those times where there's absolutely no playtesting, um, and it's all other people's games. And for me, that's, that's a real nice break from you know, the, the constant back and forth and playtesting, which I enjoy, but it's still very nice to go back to just learning new games and playing them and kind of seeing out, you know, what's out there and uh, not having to worry about what people are thinking and what they're doing and taking notes and all the other things that you do in your playtesting. Oh, sure, I'm sure. I did a little playtesting for Planet on one of their... I don't think it's out yet, but... I, it was very tedious, um, just constantly playing the game over and over, minor changes here and there, and then going back. And it you know, was it, I could ask. Yeah, it, it's funny. The I, it, if a game ever becomes tedious, where I'm like, Ugh, I have to go play test this, then I think there's a problem with the game. Probably if I'm not engrossed with it, which is ridiculous, because I'll you know I'll play games like one night when we tested that. That was about 450 play tests before it was published, so that's kind of ridiculous. And I would say that for the most part. I enjoyed all of those, the ones I was involved as well, as well as the ones I watched. So, you know, if I'm still enjoying it at that point, that's a very good sign. Um, if I'm not, if I'm bored or if I don't feel like playtesting a particular game, that's usually a bad sign. Uh, that means that there's something wrong with the game or there's something about that's not that engaging. And in a lot of cases, what will happen is those games kind of fall by the wayside. Um, so uh, while it's, it's work, it's still something that's uh, enjoyable and uh, it's really nice to you know, go through a playtest session like last night uh, we were working on a new game and uh, was playing had some two-player versions of that. And we didn't actually have to, have to make any changes between the, the couple of games, but it was still really fun and very engaging. And uh, you know, if we weren't so tired, we probably would have played a few more um, of, uh, uh, plays of the game. That's always good. You know that that's, that game is in pretty good shape if you're excited about playing it late at night and you're sad about you know, not being able to do any more playtesting because you're too tired. Yeah, it sounds like, sounds like it would be. Um, so how, how do you design? Is it theme first and then mechanics, or the other way around? Or it depends on the game. Um, you know, it's uh, I think it, it really depends on the game. Um, for me, there's no particular thing where I think of, oh, that's a cool theme. I'll have to build the game around that. Uh, it's sometimes that happens. Sometimes there's, wow, I really like uh, you know, blind bidding. It'd be really cool to do a game based on that, or uh, trick taking, or or something, and doing a game based on that. So it depends on whatever I'm focused on or excited about at the time, you know, kind of what strikes me. Uh, certainly for a game like Castles, uh, it was a combination of theme and mechanics. Um, you know, I liked the idea of in suburbia you were building up the city, but it was, it was very abstracted. And, you know, for me, initially I thought, well, wouldn't it be cool just to build one of the things on one of those piles, one of those buildings, individual buildings, as opposed to the whole, the whole city. And so it started more as a giant mansion because that's a lot of fun. Eventually that changed to castles. Um, but in that particular case, it was the theme of let's you know kind of dig into uh, a little bit of what made suburbia interesting. But at the same time, the mechanics ended up being totally different than suburbia. There's some similarities in that you place tiles. Uh, you purchase them and place tiles, but other than that, the actual gameplay ends up being entirely different. Uh, yeah, it is two totally different games, but they do have a similar feel to an extent. Um, same with Subdivision. I played that once or twice, um, although I, I know that wasn't your design, but you still get the same feel from it. Um, you know, and it's it's interesting how you could take one similar feel and spread them out through three or four games, like like you did. Yeah. 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 It's it it worked out. I, mean, I like the idea of building things and coming up with something, creating something. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons I think that deck building games appeal to a lot of people because uh, you're you're building something and deck building games it's hidden. You know, you have your own little private stash of stuff, but still, every time you buy a new card, you're adding to that and you're giving yourself some new capabilities and 
even though most of those games, it's random when that new functionality comes out. That's kind of cool. And you have that same sort of thing with both castles and suburbia, where every time you buy a tile, um, you're adding some sort of enhancement um, to what you've already built. And you may be able to use it in the future, you might not, but it, it adds and it gives you more possibilities. It opens you up to more options. It's kind of fun. Yeah, sorry, there's a little bit of lag on your end. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so um, now, how long does it usually take to, to get a game from the time it's playtest and you say, all right, it's good, to people get it in their hands? Like, what, what's the step from you sending it off to the printer to people oh. getting it in, in their hands? Um, that tends to be about, probably I'd say four months. Um, you know, usually the way I work, I tend to, you know, when, when I know there's a game that we're testing that I know we're going to produce, um, we all have the art and I'll have most of the graphic design, everything done for it while we're still play testing and tweaking um, some things. Um, and then occasionally I might have to get additional art uh, late in the process, but for the most part, um, I try and get a lot of that stuff done out of the way um, because art can be one of the biggest uh, hurdles, one of the things that can really slow down the, the production of a game if you don't have it all in place. So I, I tend to work that way, and a lot of times with playtesting. So for, for Castles, for instance, we had the art back in January of this year, and uh, we were still playtesting all the way through April. I think we finished probably the end of April, or um, that, that was the last time we actually did any playtesting where we knew we might change something in the game at that point, and then it was uh, from then until May, June, July, August, September, so five months from then until it was available in uh, October. So it, it varies in the game, but it's probably four to five months, I think, that when it's finished, finished, and when it's actually available. Okay. Yeah, I was, just, I was curious on the business aspect a little bit. Um, so what is the most expensive process of a game? Is it like cards or art? Well, I'm sure it's artwork, but... Yeah. You know, uh, and our work depends on the artists. You know, there's some artists that work uh, incredibly inexpensively relative to the stuff they produce. Um, you know, production, of course, uh, the actual production of the game uh, tends to be the bulk of the cost. You know, certainly the one you produce that becomes uh, the larger amount of the game. Um, those are the two biggest things. Um, fortunately, I have a graphic design background, so I'm able to put things together and do a lot of the pre-production work myself. Um, which is, uh, you know, just a huge little extra bonus of being able to open up a file when I get a note back from the printer and they say, hey, uh, you know, there's an element here that's not CMYK, it's RGB, I have to fix it. I don't need to send it off to a, my graphic designer and have them fix it and send it back. I can just make that change and turn it around in, in a couple hours. Um, so that's nice. That helps a lot. Um, All right. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, Bezier Games, that's a kind of interesting name. What, what, is, what is a Bezier? <laughs> um, so, uh, Bezier Games comes from Bezier Curves, um, which were created by Pierre Bezier. Pierre Bezier was a mathematician in the 1950s. He worked at Renault, the car company Renault in France. And uh, in the 50s, they were trying to um, basically design uh, cars with all those great curves. Basically, you know, if you look at 50s cars, they have everything has these amazing curves to it. It's all smooth. And in the 40s and early 50s, that was all being done by hand. There were actually, uh, you know, the, the people who were creating those were actually pounding out those shapes by hand. Uh, in the advent of that time, computers came along, they started to be able to cut things, and they could do very basic angled cutting, but nothing could do curves yet. And so Pierre Bézier was a mathematical wizard for the most part. He came up with a very simplistic formula that allowed computers to cut things on a very smooth curve. And uh, that particular... Um, mathematical equation was then used in all sorts of other things. It's used today in 3D applications. It's used in um, it's used in printers for printing out fonts. All, all every font has Bezier curves. Is you know, every curve on a, a letter is made of that, and uh, it's kind of the underlying technology that allows um, things to print faster and to display even on your screen um, more quickly than otherwise. And uh, in the mid 90s, I was um, working and teaching people on how to go from analog to digital um, graphic design using Photoshop and Illustrator and Quark Express. And uh, I was starting to write at that time. And one of the first books that I wrote was uh, the Adobe Illustrator Bible. And uh, I got Pierre Bezier, found, found his contact information, and got him to write the foreword to that book. 
And uh, when I did that, I was like enamored and thinking this is a very cool guy in my geekiness. And uh, he he said, sure, that's you know, he write the forward, and he uh, also yeah, I asked him, and he said it would be fine to name uh, my company after him. So that was kind of neat. Um, so I, I named my company after him. This is before I was doing games at all, and uh, you know, it's just kind of consulting and writing. And uh, then you know, several years later, when I started actually producing games, then I said, well, I already have the name of the company. Uh, it's in place here, and it's unique. Um, so I went ahead and just used that name for the company. And uh, I tried to be super clever like with our logo. It consists of straight lines, no curves, because I thought that was very ironic and clever. But no one ever gets that, so I have to always explain it because people never understand that there's a bunch of fun little irony in our, in our logo that has the green straight lines on it as opposed to any curves at all. Yeah, I don't I don't think <laughs> people would get what a Bezier is unless they're in a like program you know, uh, illustration like you were saying. Um, for clever-osity, so that's probably not that great of a thing. <laughs> so um which game in your, your line would you consider your evergreen game? Well probably um, Ultimate Werewolf by itself. Uh, Ultimate Werewolf has done uh, the base, the original Ultimate Werewolf game since 2007 when it first came out. Um, it has more than doubled in sales every year that it's it's been available. Um, you know, it's been eclipsed, I think, in uh, visibility and popularity by some other games that are more recent, but it is one that continues to sell, and like I said, every year it, it sells better and better and better um, as more and more people discover social deduction. And, uh, you know, increasing the line and now having two other games in Position and one night in that line, uh, both of which have done well as well, uh, just kind of underscores the fact that that's something that people really, really like. And you know, it's it's amazing. There's so many people that have never heard of Werewolf at all, and uh, it just there's just a huge potential market for it. Um, so so I would say Ultimate World more than anything else. It's actually one game I never played. I do have Inquisition and One Night Werewolf, but uh, the original one. I can never get a group big enough to. I tried it once, but they were too drunk. One woman couldn't keep their eyes shut, and yeah. <laughs> you know, so. yeah, it can be okay or fun if you are drunk. But if you're not drunk and you're playing with people who are drunk, then it becomes a lot less fun. Yeah. Uh, like a lot of games, unfortunately. Yeah, um, Inquisition is one I actually enjoy. I played that a lot with my sister, and my wife. It's one that I found works really well with three players. Um, in that social deduction thing, most of the time you need like six, eight, ten people, but Inquisition is one I found does work really well with three players, and I actually want to get it on my channel one day, it's just scheduling. Um, was that your design, or I don't, I don't remember offhand? No, that was actually uh, the design of a guy, uh, Legend Dan Hoffman. Uh, he brought it to me several years ago. Um, we've been playing regular Werewolf together at a few different cons, and he brought it to me, and his original idea was it was a, the idea was to have a game you could play while you're waiting for people to get together to play regular Werewolf. Um, and it turned into a little more than that, of course, over time, a little longer than he had originally envisioned. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was a really cool concept. Um, the whole idea of having, kind of abstracting out the village into cards, kind of a tableau of cards that everyone's focusing on, and it's kind of like a concentration thing. You're like, okay, where are the where are the werewolves in this, in this village that exist in these cards? And then the, the fun twist of all the players are, are playing, they're trying to figure this out, but some of the players are, of course, werewolves themselves protecting those, those werewolves. Uh, it was a really fun idea, and uh, you know, we, we spent a lot of time. Originally, he had set it up so it was, it was a lot more players. It was probably like I think seven to twelve, or at least minimum five players. Uh, but when we were playing it, we determined that you know this could work with less, and so we spent a lot of time. And it was probably delayed in production by about six to twelve months, almost, so that we could get the three and four player game uh, right and have it balanced right, so we didn't have to do anything really weird for it. So. I'm always glad to hear when people say that they played it with three or four players and they're having a good time because that is a tough thing to do with social deduction games um, is those small player counts. Um, you know, the idea that you have one werewolf out of three or four other players um, and the, you know, only the, they have to figure this out and that it doesn't break the game if they do, that's kind of cool. Yeah, I do like that. Even if you're called as a werewolf, you can manipulate the game so that you, you, know, you still come up ahead. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah exactly. there's, there's the first couple rounds where no one's quite sure, and you're doing things, you're trying not to get caught, but you also know that if you do, do get caught, it's not the end of the world. You still have additional weapons at your disposal. You have a slight edge over the rest of the, 
the, the gamers at the table, so that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, it is, especially for me, because I'm a horrible werewolf, um, <laughs> as my wife insists, I'll tell you, but... Um, now, one way to well, ultimate werewolf, that, uh, that's been a pretty good hit with my fam, the group I play with my family. Um, how, how did that come about, that this the idea of just breaking it down to one night instead of you know multiple process elimination and player elimination? Yeah, so, I mean, that uh, one night, uh, again, it's, it's something that I think it takes, like, idea of werewolf kind of turns it on its head a little bit. Um, the one thing that uh, a lot of traditional werewolf players, ultimate werewolf players, uh, right away have a hard time with is this idea that your individual role can change. And it's very hard for some of those people to get past that step and to realize that that's, that's actually part of the game is trying to figure out who you are, if you've been modified or if your part has been changed, which team you're on, and then the next step is to figure out who's on the other team so you can vote and kill them. And uh, that by itself is it's unique in... In social deduction games, um, you know, having that, got to figure out what my own card is. I don't know what my card is for sure. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I think I know what it is. And if that's the case, then this is the action I have to take as a result of that. Um, and that definitely got, has people excited. And, you know, there is there's something oh, that's, a, that's a, a ton of fun about being part of a game or even watching a game where you've got people passionately arguing. And at the end of the game, they realize they've been arguing in the wrong direction because, you know, they're not on that team. and Or that they have sold out their fellow werewolf and they didn't realize that they were now on the werewolf team. And, uh, you know, that's there's just something inherently really fun about about that. And, uh, you know, uh, no one seems to take it too seriously, which is really good to see. I guess possibly because the game is so short and they're able to play again and again. Uh, but, but people really seem to have a really good time with that and they get really caught in the five to ten minutes that they have of uh, figuring out or what's going on at the table? Yeah, I, I we play a, a good bit, um, even with larger groups. Up when I go to Pennsylvania, and uh, yeah, you see that people arguing for the wrong side. All they get caught up on that, and, and it's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, one one thing I really like to see is, uh, and I've done this, um, but but it but it happens, and it's really amazing to to kind of reconstruct it afterwards. Is you'll come up with a lie. You know, you, maybe you started as a werewolf, you don't want to tell anyone, so you, you know, you come up with a story that you're the troublemaker and you switch two cards. And People believe that you're the troublemaker and you switch two cards at some point, and eventually you kind of believe that, kind of forget you're the werewolf, and so you've done, you know, this story that you've come up with is so compelling, even to yourself, that you're arguing for it, and uh, sometimes you forget to vote the right way because you really didn't do that action, you know. Uh, and uh, that's that's really amusing too. That that happens quite often. Um, in one of our our test uh, groups, uh, we where we were doing our videos uh, initially for the first version of, of one night. Um, I remember that that happened. In fact, that's that's on the video there where the one person she was a werewolf and. She knew she was a werewolf, but she had been lying so emotionally and passionately about not being one that she forgot she actually was a werewolf and ended up killing the other werewolf that she was pretty sure was a werewolf because she convinced everyone else that that person was a werewolf and not her, even though that was the, the total wrong thing to do. But she was so into the lie that she created uh, that uh, uh, she kind of forgot her original intent and in role, which is kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, it is a fun, it is a fun game. Um, although I know, I know you, uh, you updated this in the app where with the noise, the background noise, and all that. Yeah. Uh, a guy played with, with his biggest complaint was people would bang on the table to eliminate that noise while he's trying to play like a euro game two tables away. <laughs> you know, it, it would drive him nuts. Yeah, um, you know, it's funny. It's uh, there, there's that complaint, but we actually hear more that people are just too loud. And the funny thing is, uh, a lot of times we'll have one night playing next to regular werewolf, and uh, the people who are eliminated start up the game one night, and they start playing and playing, and uh, they get louder and louder and louder until the people who are playing regular werewolf complain. They're like, okay, go away, go away, you, you are obnoxious, move away, we're trying to be serious and focused here playing regular werewolf, and you guys are screaming and yelling at each other. Uh, and and with one night, it's funny that it's, it doesn't stop when the game's over. When the game's over and everyone flips the card over, it gets louder a lot of times uh, than when they were, um, you know, vociferously denying or, you know, accusing someone. 
and it gets louder afterwards because then they're like, oh my god, what happened? Who did this? And everyone's going back and forth. And um, that's yeah, it's unfortunate for other players, but you know the people playing one night are having a really great time, which is fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, how did um, the expansion Daybreak come along? I mean, did you when you were done Werewolf, did you think that's it? I can't improve on the game, or or, or is this being play tested at the same time and just decided to cut it out? Or yeah, so uh, the original one night rolls, um, we had I don't know how many rolls. There's all sorts of rolls that we've been we've been testing for a while with one night. Um, a chunk of those didn't make it into one night because they were either too complex, too weird, or we had enough of that type of role. Um, the original game, you know, we tried to have you know just enough of everything in there to make it feel balanced and to give people something to do, but still not be overwhelming in terms of all the different things that can happen at night. Which is why there's basic villagers and it seems strange. It seems strange now, but it, basic werewolves. Um, I don't think anyone, if I had told anyone in uh, who played the original game, we're going to have special-powered werewolves. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. Werewolves already have a special power. Um, but we had those, and uh, so we kind of pushed those aside and focused on the core to make that you know, as good as possible for the, the core game. And so you know, we knew there would be an expansion at some point um, or a sequel, and we decided that you know, we actually can have a sequel that can stand by itself, which is more complex. Um, it kind of takes it up uh, one level of complexity from the original One Night, but you can also combine with the original game and, uh, you know, there's still more things, and, you know, we'll, we'll have another sequel, um, I'm sure, uh, in the near future um, with, with other things that didn't make it into this for various reasons. Uh, I'm actually very excited. It's funny because I'm already testing the next version of things, um, you know, when something comes out. And so now I'm, I'm very excited about Daybreak and enthusiastic that people are excited about it, but I'm, I'm much more focused on the next version of the game that has a whole other thing to it that I can't talk about yet. Because uh, we're still working on it, and uh, that's going to be very exciting when that comes out hopefully next year. Not good, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, like I said, it's a very enjoyable game. The one I ultimately aware of, and I, I think it'll do well with it, the whole line. Um, yeah. Um, where was going to go with that? Oh, sorry, I blanked out there. Um, <laughs> so, um. When you're when you're designing a game, do you have a specific audience in mind, or or is it just something you want to see come across as a game? I think in general, as the game's being designed, I I definitely think about you know how how different types of people are going to respond to it. Um, you know, one of the things you mentioned that your your wife likes suburbia, um, that the, the fact that that females in general like suburbia was a surprise. I wouldn't have thought that a city building game was something that would appeal to women. But it does, um, and definitely more so than a lot of other Euro games. And uh, that's that's a pleasant surprise. And Castle seems to be doing the exact same thing. Um, that uh, you know, one of the things that who knew that women, in particular, like building things in games, and that's something that really appeals to them versus you know a straight, more traditional economic game like Age of Steam or something, uh, which certainly is definitely a more male centric. Um, sort of, and in the gaming industry, the board game industry, which is dominated by males, you know, very, very heavily, probably 80, 20 or something like that, or maybe even higher. Uh, it's really nice to know that uh, their female gamers um, are are enjoying the kind of games they're putting out there. So that's something I'm thinking about now. That I'm like, hmm, I wonder if this will appeal to that particular demographic of female gamers. Um, but uh, you know, in general, I, I would love for any game that I do to be accessible to casual gamers, strategy gamers, pretty much any type of gamers, um, not just for the, hey, everyone will buy a copy, but just because that way they'll, they'll enjoy it. You know, it's, it's not fun when you buy a game and your spouse or your kids or whatever can't play or don't want to play it because of the theme and mechanics or whatever, There's a whole bunch of reasons. And, you know, you're never going to have a game that's such a wide cross-section that everyone likes it. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of games you know, that, that fall in the category that I'm, I'm really... I'm happy that Suburbia and uh, Castles in particular kind of appeal across genders at least. Um, so, yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I was, like I said, I was surprised, Jen, like, just because there being so much math in Suburbia. But she really did like that. And I think she enjoys uh, Castles 
but she won't tell me. She never tells me. She's afraid I'll go out and buy everything for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll find out next next week <laughs> when we film it. But yeah, I I think she does like it. And like you said, I was I was surprised, um, because it's so heavy in math. And typically, I shouldn't say typically, but statistically, women aren't as strong in math as they are in other categories. You know, reading and all that. And it may not even be they're not as strong. I don't think that they're as interested in mathematical. Yeah. Um, unless it's unless it, there's a, a good veil of it of something else. Um, my daughter uh, is a teenager, and she in general shies away from the typical heavier Euro type games. Uh, but uh, I know there's a couple types of games she likes, and oddly enough, they, if if there's a shopping veneer on a game, she likes it. So one of the games she absolutely loves, which makes no sense to me without stepping back and looking at it that way, is Macau. So it's a Stefan Feld game. That's really, I mean, there's it's a fairly heavy game, but she loves it because she thinks of it as she's going shopping and what can she buy with the, you know, what she's accumulated. Which I have no idea why that that particular aspect appeals to her that much, but it really does. And she's like, okay, this is really fun. Um, but you know, underneath all the mechanics, I mean, that's a, a fairly heavy economic euro game underneath there. So um, you know. That's, I guess it depends on the game and depends on how people perceive it. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, I know you just went to uh, Essen. Were you there personally, or was it just part of your crew? Yes, uh, we were there. We had our biggest booth, booth ever at, at Essen. We had uh, about 20 booth staff there, we had eight tables running full-time, uh, showing off castles and subdivision and, and uh, daybreak. And... Uh, you know, it's that's my tenth year in a row that I've gone to Essen. The eighth year in a row that we've had a booth at the show, um, and our biggest booth yet um, there. And it is, it's yeah. I, I wouldn't want to miss it, but at the same time, when it comes to Saturday or Sunday, the last couple of days of the show, I cannot wait to go home. It's so exhausting. It's probably the most exhausting five six days uh, that I spend all year, um, and uh, a lot of. You know, we do a lot of releases. We tend to do a release or two at Essen. You know, so we have new games that come out then. And a lot of things are kind of lined up and funneled towards um, you know, the middle of October each year. And uh, it's yeah, it's awesome. Love Essen, um, but it, it's exhausting as well. Now, how different are the European crowds at Essen as opposed to, like, the Americans here at, like, uh, Gen Con or Origins or one of them? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, Gen Con is actually getting. Uh, we've only been. We've only had booths, a booth at, at Gen Con for the last two years. Um, but I can see, even in the last two years, how Gen Con's changing and getting closer to the way Essen is. Um, the weird thing about Essen is that you know there is no gaming. There's no um, scheduled gaming. There's no open gaming. There's no place to play games except in publishers' booths um, or at hotels. Uh, after you know, the show closes, and the show is open a ridiculous amount of time. It's, it opens at 10 o'clock every day and closes at 7. Um, and uh, it actually, I don't know why they do this, but they keep letting people in earlier and earlier this year. They let people in at 10 of 10, and they didn't really kick people out until about quarter after 7 or 7.30. Um, and so it's a very long day for everybody involved. But there's no, you know, the gaming that you do there at the show is in a publisher's booth. Uh, they don't allow you to, there's a couple areas where you can sit down and eat. They don't allow you to play games in those areas. They're specifically, you know, it is verboten uh, to do that. And, you know, they'll come along and say, no, 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 you cannot have a game out here. You must put that away and, uh, you know, enjoy your food and then get up and leave so someone else can sit down and eat. Uh, there's no playing games at tables there, which is really unusual because if you look at a, a place like Gen Con, um, there's games everywhere. People are sitting in the halls playing games or in the, the food court eating games. Are playing games. They're, uh, they're, you know, in publishers' booths to some extent, but there's you know, lots of open gaming areas or scheduled gaming areas, and so that's a, a very different. Where Essen, the focus is really the publishers and the new games that are out, and it's it is you know 90 percent of of what you see there tends to be new games, games that just came out within the last couple of months or were just introduced at Essen, whereas Gen Con, it's uh, a little bit more spread out. Um, there are some new releases, of course, there, but a lot of people are there um, from all over the U.S. and a little internationally, but from all over the U.S. just to kind of see what games are available from different publishers. And so, you know, we'll we'll still sell a lot of games that have been out for a long time at Gen Con, whereas at Essen, you know, 90% of the stuff we sell is the brand new stuff. 
Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's, I'd like to get there one year. I'd like to yeah, get to it, Europe in general. Yeah. It, it, it's hard to explain what it's like. Um, it's such an overwhelming... The, the number of people, the intensity, and, uh, you know, it's... For a board gamer, it's it's better than Christmas. It's just... It's awesome. And, uh, you know, you, people often ask, well, how much money should I bring? And... There is no amount that's high enough. You will, oh, whatever amount you set yourself at, you will spend more. Regardless of whatever your budget is, you will find a way to get more money to spend more and buy more things than you thought you would ever want to buy. And you'll buy things you probably wouldn't have bought, but you're in this environment and everything seems shinier and newer than it normally would. Um, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's it's very very bad. If you're addicted to buying board games, then going to Essen is 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 like uh, you know super and crack. It's really bad. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I don't want to keep you too long. It's getting late. Um, so, like I said, I'm trying this new thing. Uh, Lance Moister uh, suggested to me a couple months ago. Um, I got three questions. First one is, what game do you typically like and everybody else hates? Do I like and everyone else hates? Um, I think in general, I like. There's there's types of games, but probably the one specific one is Geist Blitz. Uh, if you've ever played that, that's the um, pattern matching game with cards. Uh, it's a German game, and uh, it's fairly popular in Europe. Not so much, not so popular here. Um, I like those types of games. They're kind of it's a it's a reaction sort of game. You flip over cards. There's objects on the card. You have to grab objects or say something or do something. And uh, except for my son, who's better than I am now because his brain just works that way, uh, and it's annoying. And I don't like playing with him as a result. Um, I tend to do pretty well at it, so that's something that I like playing. No one else does because they know that because I'm I like that. I'm so focused that I'm going to do better. Okay. Um, what's a game that you hate and everybody else seems to love? Uh, Brass is probably the top of the list. Um, I have no idea why I don't like it. Well, I do actually. It's too fiddly. It's too fiddly. It feels too long. Um, I don't. I don't. I'm not at all attracted by. Um, but everybody else who likes your games, and my gaming group and friends, my wife, everybody else says, "Oh no, it's really good. You should, you should like this." And from everything, you know, I look at it, I really should like it because I do like economic types of, of games and constructing routes and things like that. But boy, I just really do not like that game. So that's that's a that's a weird anomaly that I have. Yeah, I only played that once and. Some of the rules were forgotten, <laughs> um, so I, I could see where you're... I have to play it several times from what everyone says. I've played it three times. Still don't like it, so I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Um, what type of uh, uh, conspiracy theory do you buy into? Type of a conspiracy theory? Um, not really much. I mean, I think in general... Um, there are no really good um, conspiracies because people figure stuff out. Um, you know, it, the the more people in a conspiracy, the less likely it is to stay a cons an actual conspiracy. Um, you know, wh whatever it is, um, I'm I'm concerned about uh, Asthma Day buying up a lot of board game companies. I don't think it's conspiracy. I think it's probably bad for the industry in general because uh, you look at Hasbro right now and with the exception of Wizards of the Coast they don't really put out a lot of great stuff anymore. Uh, Asthma Day you know uh, uh, buying up Days of Wonder and um, a few other companies that seems like that has the potential for long term bad for the industry as opposed to good um, so I don't know if that's necessarily a conspiracy but I think it's, it's probably a bad direction Overall, now I say this, and two years from now, Asmodee offers to buy me out for a lot of money, and maybe I'll say yes, and then I'll totally change my tune and say this is the best thing I've ever heard games. So, um, I have myself on the record both directions for that, just in case. I actually meant to ask you when we first started, when is Asmodee going to buy you out? I forgot to. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I'm not much of a blip on their radar yet, but we'll see. Yeah, everybody else is. You're, yeah. You know. <laughs> um, so, um. If you had advice to somebody just getting the hobby, uh, what would it be? Um, get into the hobby of playing games or designing games. Uh, well, you could do both. Let's, let's start with playing games first. The playing games, it's play as many different types of games as possible. 
to kind of figure out what you like. Um, it's really easy. I know for me that um, I kind of got in a bit of a rut in kind of the, the heavy strategy Euro stuff, the Tigris and Euphrates and, and, and those sorts of games and um, uh, to call that sort of thing. And it was hard for me to break out of that into a lot of the other uh, games that I ended up really liking, like uh, dexterity games and social deduction games and, and other things that uh, I might never have been exposed to if I had stayed in kind of the traditional economic Euro game that I was in. And uh, just kind of be open to those sorts of things. Prime, you may discover you don't like it, um, you know, and, uh, but, but I think, you know, there's so many different types of games out there that uh, if you have a lot of different things, you know, a try. Uh, once or twice, and uh, you know, you'll, you'll find the things you like and you don't like, but but definitely try those different categories and, and try the, the newer types of games and different things that are coming out. Okay, good advice. Um, now, how about for a, a designer? Uh, as a game designer, I think uh, probably the most important thing is play testing. Um, Whatever you're designing, well, first of all, you have to love what you're designing. You have to enjoy what you're doing. Never make something because you think it's going to sell well, because I don't think that's ever successful. Uh, or maybe it is, but credit, that's got to be a good percentage. You've got to love the game that you're making, and I think that a lot of times that will come through. Um, you got to play test a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton. Nobody play tests enough, as far as I'm concerned. Even when I'm, you know, I'm thinking, okay, the game's done, I'm thinking, oh, what if I could have gotten 20 more play test sessions in? Would that have changed something? Um, and I think, yeah, I see a lot of games out there, even from big publishers, that just feel like, ah, oh, it's not polished enough. It could have been, it could have been better. It could have been like, you know, one of my top ten games if they had done this, this, and this, and they didn't. And you know, maybe they did at some point. They, they rejected some ideas or did some different. But definitely feels like a lot of games aren't aren't uh, aren't uh, tested enough. And I would say stay away from Kickstarter as a designer, um, unless until you have a game that you know, people are absolutely demanding just because your friends and family enjoy playing that does not mean it's something you should pay a ton of money for some nice art and put it up on the starter uh, because uh, that can leave a really bad taste in someone's mouth uh, when they get a game that's, that's you know, not completely tested and not completely developed through. Yeah, it sounds like a voice too. Yeah. I'm not kind of that, but I kind of stay away from Kickstarter because of that half-baked game being a Put out. You know, I don't know how to pick the right one yet. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 really tough. Um, you know, it, there's a lot of games I back, even reading the rules and looking at the components and going, you know what, this is going to be great. Um, and boy, they they flop so bad, and you have to wonder where was this play tested outside of a very small group that already had this kind of group thing going. Um, there was this one game I backed called Do Move Say, and I thought, wow, this sounds like it's this awesome social game, party game. Uh, it's really highly interactive. And the more I read about it, I was like, wow, you know, if, if this turns out to be good, I'm going to contact the designer and maybe if I can publish this game for him. I was that excited about this game. So I got it. Uh, I got my Kickstarter copy. We played, and it flopped so terribly because it was you had to be in this, this, this total different type of mode, and the game ended up being kind of more of an experience thing than an actual game of the... 10 plus players that had to play, only one of them was actually playing a game. Everyone else was kind of acting or kind of playing a part and not really having any control over anything. And <clears throat> you couldn't tell that from the rules. And the rules, it seemed like everyone was doing something and they're all working towards a, a different goal, but it wasn't the case at all. It was there was window dressing. There were people who were acting as window dressing, and there was one person who was trying to figure something out, and they were going to win or lose. And that was a miserable experience for everybody involved. And uh, it, one of those things that I just couldn't tell from the Kickstarter and from the rules and from everything how good it was actually going to be. Um, and so it's, it's really deceptive, I think, on Kickstarter, the read description of the game, how you, know, how you think it's going to end up playing if you actually experience it yourself. Uh, all right, so um, what's in the future for Buzzy uh, 8 Games? Um, more more stuff. Uh, we have uh, at least uh, well, at least one big new game next year that's coming out, which I, we can't really talk about. You know, as we say, we don't talk about unannounced products. Um, so we've got one big new game. We've got um, you know uh, expansions. There's an expansion to Suburbia that's going to be coming out uh, that does uh, some some awesome things. Um, and like I said, just see another sequel to One Night, which uh, is, is looking to be pretty 
grievance, yeah. Okay. Um, now, for my viewers, uh, where, where could they get a hold of you, like, see your products or stuff like that? Yeah, they can go to www.bezziagames.com. All our stuff is listed there, and uh, we have free shipping in the U.S. for everybody. Uh, that's cool. I did not actually know that, the free shipping in the U.S. Um, uh, is there anything you want to throw out there? Or? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, if, you, if, you, if people haven't gotten a chance to play... Uh, Castles, or they haven't uh, played one night yet. I mean, those two games are, are doing very, very well. They're, they're, they're ranking very high on BGG. People are very excited about them, so I'd encourage you to try and really get more those in when you have a chance. Yeah, yeah they're both very good games, um, like I said. All right, so uh, I never know how to end these things. Um, <laughs> I, I, do, I do want to talk to you a little bit after we stop broadcasting. Okay. All right. So everybody watching, thanks for watching. See you next time. <laughs>